Got kicked out of school at the age of 15 onto my dad's building site. On my dad's building site, I realized I hated being poor. So I started getting people into nightclubs. I started getting people into private parties. I started throwing my own private parties. Never invited anyone that was poor because I know what being poor is like and it's sh So I only ever invited millionaires and billionaires and I started building up this network. And as the network grew, I ended up working for Formula One, for the Kentucky Derby, the Grammys, uh, Sir Elton John's Oscar party, and I started working with the most affluent brands in the planet. We were talking about Polo, you know, the West Palm Beach Polo, Santa Barbara Polo, Stard, Cartier. There wasn't, for a 25-year period, there was not a high-level event in the planet that I was not involved in. I was like the Make-A-Wish Foundation for billionaires. Guys, Matt Haycox here, and welcome to another episode of the Matt Haycox Show, where I've got a guest that I'm very, very excited to introduce you all to today. I've got Steve Sims, an originally a bricklayer from London, uh, all the way to living in the California now, and he works with Elon Musk, Elton John, or has worked with Elon Musk, Elton John. He's serenaded pasta eaters in Florence uh, with Andre Bocelli singing to them. He's got two books out. And most, most importantly, I just think he's a great guy with great energy. And I have to say, you know, I, I don't do an awful lot of uh, booking my own guests for, for my podcast. You know, they, they, tend, they tend to come to me either through PR guys or friends of friends or whatever. And I, I tend to be a bit more passive with it. But um, I saw Steve on somebody else's podcast. Didn't, can't even particularly remember what he was talking about, but I just loved his energy. Thought, what a great character. And literally immediately reached out to him. And after much scheduling conflict due to our international time zones, He's here today, uh, and I know we're going to have a fun conversation. We've only been talking for five minutes before we started recording, and like I say, great energy, and lo looking forward to having him here. So, Steve, thank you very much, buddy. Thanks for having me, pal. I appreciate it. I mean, I guess it's quite a, quite an introduction and quite a story to say, you know, bricklayer from London to, you know, working with the likes of Elton John, Elon Musk, et cetera. I mean, just just give us all a, a bit of background, a bit, a bit of storytelling of, of, of what, what that really means and how it happened. Um, Got kicked out of school at the age of 15 onto my dad's building site. Um, on my dad's building site, I realized I hated being poor and I was aggravated and I didn't know anyone with money. So I went out to try and find people with money by getting a different job that hopefully would surround me with people with money, yacht charters, jet charters, security, stockbroking. I got fired from everything. But my goal was always to change the room I was in and to get to hang around with rich people. Um, I ended up working at a nightclub in Hong Kong on the door, and I suddenly started to see rich people. You know, I'm on about people with money and then people to pretend they had money. And my whole goal was to have a conversation, and I can't labor on that enough. And then I realized if I could do something for you, I could have a conversation. So I started getting people into nightclubs. I started getting people into private parties. I started throwing my own private parties. Never invited anyone that was poor because I know what being poor is like, and it's shit. So I only ever invited millionaires and billionaires, and I started building up this network. And as the network grew, I ended up working for Formula One, for the Kentucky Derby, uh, the Grammys, the uh, Sir Elton John's Oscar party, and I started working with the most affluent brands in the planet. We were talking about... Polo, you know, the West Palm Beach Polo, um, Santa Barbara Polo, Stard, Cartier. You know, there wasn't, for a 25-year period, there was not a high-level event in the planet that I was not involved in. So um, I ended up doing the wish fulfillment. In fact, Forbes called me the real-life Wizard of Oz, and it really did well. I was like the Make-A-Wish Foundation for billionaires. I would get them, as you say, you know, a private dinner at the feet of Michelangelo's David, drum lesson by Guns N' Roses. But it was always an aggravation of being poor and striving for this education. And then five years ago, I wrote a book, Blue Fishing, not expecting it to take off, but it absolutely did. And now I coach and train and speak all over the planet on how to become a value brand yourself and be an asset. You know what? There's there's so many different avenues of questioning I could go down off off the back of what you said, <laughs> but 
I want the, it's it's just such apt timing, and I think that's something so important for people for people listening to here. Because I, I, I was at uh, dinner, well, not a dinner. I went for a I went for a shishu and a chat with a with a friend slash loose uh, business partner or guy investing in his business with literally an hour ago, and and one of the, he was asking me about his his career plans or what you know what he should be doing, how he should be moving forward. And I asked him if he'd ever move here to Dubai because he spends a lot of time here in Dubai. And his answer was, no, I don't want to come to Dubai because I feel like I will be the poorest person in Dubai and I don't want to come there feeling, feeling like the poorest person. You know, it, it just won't sit with me. Do you know, how, do you know what that means? Uh, again, to put this into context, I mean, we talk about a guy who's, who's got, you know, a, 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 a very low six figure salary. So to say he's the poorest person in Dubai, it's a bit of a, you know, a, uh, an overstatement. But, um, you know, to put it into context, it's, you know, do you agree? As a, absolutely not. I, I actually think the exact opposite of what you're saying as a, you know, what, what, what is the point in being the, the richest person in the smallest, shittiest town somewhere in Europe? As you may feel like you're coming here as the poorest person, but first of all, that's just psychology because it doesn't matter how much money you've got in Dubai, you still feel like a poor person. Uh, the reality is you may be coming here poor, but you are going to be surrounded by so much opportunity. And, you know, you, with your attitude, with your hunger, will find a way to leverage that opportunity in days, if not weeks. And believe me, you know, you will no longer feel like the, the poorest person in Dubai. And it immediately hit him and, you know, and, and he was like, yeah, you know what, maybe you're right. Maybe I've been looking at it wrong. But I just thought that's, it's such a fortuitous timing of that conversation to, to have happened when, you know, you, you were saying at the beginning of your story, the reason you started to do what you did is because you felt, you know, when you were poor, you didn't like being poor and you wanted to surround yourself by money. And I just cannot overstate to people the importance of, you know, of putting yourself in the proximity of people you want to be like, you know, whether that's money, whether that's athletes or actors or, or whatever it is. If you try and be the biggest fish in the smallest pond, that is all you're ever going to be. And it's the wrong thing to be. I remember sitting in East London and I had this old shitty Honda. I've always been on motorcycles and I still am. But I was on this old shitty Honda that would start whenever it felt like it. And I'm in this bar with a bunch of broke-ass bikers. And I looked around at them and I thought, there is no hope here. There is no potential. There's no future. Everyone in this bar had settled. And I was in that room. And therefore, I realized, I'm in the wrong freaking room. You've got to change the room you're in. And I started associating with these people, quite simply, to get the energy, to get the opportunity, to get the mindset in order to be able to react to it to make myself one of those affluent people. I mean, did someone, did you have let's say a mentor, for, for example, or, 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 or so a friend or, or someone in your family that was helping you think like that at that age? Because whilst we talk about this being the right attitude now, you know, as that 16-year-old bricklayer from London in poverty, you know, this is, uh, you know, not the, ex not the kind of mindset that you would expect someone like that to be thinking like. Quite the opposite, sadly. Um, this was, I came from an Irish bricklaying family where when I decided I was going to leave the construction firm to go off and find my future, I had, and I had cousins and uncles, probably about 50% of the family scorned me. Um, in fact, some of them are still pretty pissed off, even though I'm very happy now and now still on the building sites. Um, they they felt that I was scorning what they did. And I said at the time, look, I'm not disrespecting what you do or what the business is, but I just think there's got to be something more for me. And the downside is this was the 90s in England. So I did an entrepreneurism. Let's be serious. One of the biggest shows at the time in the 90s, and you'll know this one, Only Fools and Horses. Okay? Where what a quite, show. Yeah. If you were an entrepreneur – you were a joke. You were selling, you know, one-armed coats or dodgy audios that, you know, from the back of your truck. The word entrepreneur in the 80s and 90s in England meant that you couldn't get a real job. It was a, it was a disgusting thing to be, and you were borderline villain. So when I went out there to try and find these people that were doing stuff, we didn't have podcasts. We didn't have Instagram to point out how inadequate your life was. We didn't have, you know, videos, audio books. We didn't have any of that shit. I never knew anybody. And I didn't know where to get this information. And of course, the only place you could get a book was the library. Well, what do you ask for? 
What are you looking for? You don't know what you don't know. So I had an aggravation in me, but I had no idea how to satisfy it. I just knew that where I was was not right. I had to get away from it. And as I made a tremendous amount of mistakes, entered into a tremendous amount of conversations badly, I learned how to have good communication with affluent people by having bad communication with affluent people and learned from it. So it was literally just a, you know, just a, a, a perfection in training situation until I did start to get those people. And when you put yourself out there to go for great things, you start attracting those people around you to start paying attention to you and going, Oi, boy, maybe you should try this. And you go, Oh, great. You know, and I remember years ago, um, years uh, way before my book and everything i'm at a party and i'm chatting to this old fella and we just hit it off really hit it off and probably spent most of the night with each other and then we went out for dinner and then a month later we hooked up and had a, another dinner and chatting about different things and then i went to an entrepreneur event in uh, new york and as i'm sat at the table near the back and i'd booked the cheap ticket this guy comes in and starts rubbing my head now, bald guys don't like having their head touched. Not unless, you know, that's it's not something you do. And I looked around to see who this guy was, and it was him. And I was like, what are you doing here? And he's like, oh, I just got some stuff to do. I'm like, oh, we'll catch up later. He's like, yeah, I've got some people for you to meet. He said, let's catch up. And he walks off. I turn around to the rest of the table. The table are looking at me like I've just had Elvis come over to the table. And it was Jay Abraham. And I oh. hadn't got to meet the... The, the the brand that was Jay, I'd got to meet Jay. So the good thing is we became dear friends before I realized what an absolute legend he was. And, of course, the guys that he started to introduce me to were icons. And, let, and all of a sudden, my network is like about 12 names in my Rolodex that just happened to be the biggest names in the industry. And they're like, hey, Jay says you need some help on this. What are you looking for? And so I realized very early on, for you to be anywhere, you've got to be in the right room. You've got to be with people that challenge, support, make you uncomfortable, push you to demand more of yourself from a position that they're capable. You know, it, we're both British guys. It, it's hysterical when someone's got a little bit of money in a pub and they're getting financial advice off of Timmy on the corner of the bar that's, you know, can't even pay his bar tab. We listen to the wrong people. So you are a combination of the people that you surround yourself with, listen to, and that support you. So my audience know how much I drum on about networking. Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, credit networking and, and my, let's say, you know, passion and ability to it. But literally, every one of my, you know, major successes or, or you know, stepping stones over the, over the, you know, well, over my entire career. And I guess my line of business, I mean, you, you probably don't know, but my, my business is, is finance. I, I, uh, I, I fund fund small businesses in the UK, you know, lend, lend money, invest money. And I, I, I raise money from international high net worth investors and, uh, and you know, effectively co-invest and, and deploy it into UK based deals. So my particular uh, area of networking is always about growing my network with high net worth, ultra high net worth, and, and I guess other interesting people who are going to bring, bring, those, bring those into my network. So when I talk regularly about, you know, about the, the, the importance of treating networking as, as an investment activity uh, and, uh, you know, and basically you know, do, doing what it takes, you know, pay, paying the price because, because the rewards will come later. But I mean, what, what would as someone else who's you know, developed a, an incredible network over the years, what would be your one or two you know, quick, quick tips to, you know, to anyone listening of, uh, you know, this this is how to network so the first mistake i think most people make is that they think networking's easy okay there's a strategy a tactic and a technique to it you've already stated that the second biggest mistake i think is that people think you need to be outgoing to be in networks and i i've always said i play an extrovert really really well but I'm an introvert. 
You know, I like riding motorcycles because no one can phone me. No one can talk to me. I can't pick up your groceries. I'm not going to drive through a Starbucks. I'm not going to fiddle around with the radio. Can't give you a lift. I'm alone. And I love that. And so I'm an introvert. So the good thing about introverts is that when we go to a networking event, there's got to be a purpose. You know, you get a lot of extroverts, and it sounds like I'm, you know, bashing onto the extroverts, but just know your stripes. That's one of the things that I always believe in. Know your strengths, know your weaknesses, know the person you are. You get a a lot of extroverts there that just want to be the center of attention. Well, that's no good. If there's no benefit to it, you know, you tell a good joke, you walk away, that's the end of it. With networking, there's got to be a purpose. Why are you there? And you're there to engage in conversations that quite simply move the needle. So if you're in a conversation that's not going anywhere, two things. Either it's not worth having the conversation with that person, or two, you are the problem with that conversation. And again, as I said right at the beginning, I'm really good at speaking with some of the most powerful, affluent people in the planet because I was really bad at it. And I realized that if you if you get the wrong answer, it's because you're asking the wrong question. It's you, you, you. And you. The problem is you. So go to networking events, understanding how can you entice, uh, attract, and engage someone. Learn the ability to communicate. That's step one. Step two Why are you there? Is it because you're looking for a friend group? Is it that you're looking for a support group? Are you looking to build up your Rolodex of people that can help you in your next business? Are you looking for investors? You're whatever the purpose, move with that purpose. And those are the two things. Learn the skill and then move with purpose. So listen, I'm desperate to hear about some of these activities that you've arranged um, arranged as part of your uh, high-end concierge business over the years. I mean, obviously in, in the in the intro, you know, we talked about uh, taking people down to the bed of the Titanic, and um, uh, you've, you've provided a, a private tour of SpaceX uh, led by Elon himself. I mean. Oh, well, two questions, really. One, first of all, do you come up with these ideas that you then kind of pitch to your clientele or, or do people come to you with, you know, like really way out requests and then you just go and find a way to make them happen? And then the second part of the question is, how how do you make these things happen? I mean, how do you go and get that SpaceX tour with Elon? All right. So we can never be specific on how we got one thing because other people will try to replicate it and then I'll get sure. SpaceX calling me and moaning at me. But let's break that down into two things. The first things are people are embarrassed about saying what they want. And it's just, I'm always been boggled by it. You know, people won't say really what they want. They will dull it down so they don't look, you know, fangirly too much. So we are the ones, and that's basically, you know, I've got this new book, Go For Stupid. We've been using the terminology Go For Stupid for about 18 years. We've been using it way before there was a book for it to go on. Because here's the thing. People would come to us and they go, hey, I'd like to um, I'd like to meet the rock band journey. We'd be like, okay, great. Let me see what we can do. We'll come back to you. This is a real request, by the way. And then what we would do is we would sit around the table at the office. We'd be like, okay, we got these seven requests. The first one's up. Want to meet the rock band journey. How can we make this stupid? Now, here's the funny thing. If I say to you, Ida, Matt, we're going to do this business and it, it's impossible, but we, we're going to break through that barrier. We're going to go for the impossible, mate. We're going to make the impossible possible. What you end up doing is you end up gritting your teeth and you're like, yeah, we're going to make the impossible possible. We're going to break through that. And there's all this constriction and restriction. Nothing good comes out of that restriction. But if I say to you, Matt, let's do this business. Let's make it stupid, man. Let's come up with the most ridiculous goals. Let's go for the most amazing, stupid sellout vision. Let's go for that. Do you know what happens when you start talking like that? You smile because you've used the word stupid. And when you're using the word stupid in that kind of context, you kind of giggle. I want a stupid goal. I want a stupid vision. And you start giggling. But also what happens is your five-year-old clicks in. 
that one with all the curiosity and energy, it clicks in and then you stop thinking about the parameters. Because today, we force feed ourselves with constraints. How many times in your past, living where you are now, doing what you do now, you've satisfied it? But how many times in the past would you sit there and you go, right, I'm going to do this. And then that little bastard devil pops up on your shoulder, starts talking to you and going, you couldn't do that. What, Matt, what the hell are you talking about? You shouldn't be in this room. And you have to convince it to shut up so you get to go and do it. The downside is 90% of the time, we are the ones talking ourselves out of our goals. So when people would come to me, they'd be like, oh, I, I want to meet the rock band journey. And we sit around and go, well, how can we take that request and make it stupid? We actually got him pulled up on stage in San Diego, live in concert, and he sang five tunes as the shortest term lead singer of the rock band journey, live on stage. He was the headline singer. That's what we did. We took the request and amplified it. We had a client wanted an amazing dining experience, and you mentioned it, wanted an amazing dining experience in Florence. That was it. Okay, how can we make that stupid? Well, let's shut down the entire museum that houses Michelangelo's David, set a table of six up. He's going to own his entire museum at the feet of the most iconic statue in the world. How can we make that even more stupid? I know, while he's munching into his main course, let's get on Dre Bocelli to come in and serenade him. We constantly stack with stupidity. Stupidity allows us to dream, to play, to be a child. So, no, they don't come to us. And that's, that was kind of one of the calling cards. Now that people got to see the creativity that we had, they would come to us and go, oh, let, you know, I want to do something with that one, John. What can you do? And then we would take it from there. And now I do that with my coaching business. Where are you? Where are your standards? What are you willing to settle for? Why don't you have stupid income goals? Why don't you have stupid exit plans? Why don't you have stupid marketing and branding vision? And we actually focus on that within our clientele today. Hopefully that answers question one. No. So then question two, how do you get these big ballers? How do you get a museum in Florence that can't even speak your language to shut down? How do you get a, a tour of a uh, high security factory go, um, actually led by the number one entrepreneur out there at the moment? You know, how do you get to work with Elton John, Richard Branson, you know, Larry Page? How do you get to do these things? You show up with value. Now, I'm going to play a game with you, Matt. All right. Have you ever heard the barbecue game? No. So this Saturday night, I'm having a barbecue in Los Angeles, and you're in the area, and I say, hey, Matt, come to my barbecue. What's the first question you ask me? What can I, well, I would say, what, what can I bring? Well, are you going to, what are you going to say? Where do you live? But... All right. So you ask me, what can you bring? My party, that question's going to benefit me. Now, uh, this is a weird thing. Most guys get it wrong because you 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 faltered. You were going to go. Well, where is it? We've I, <laughs> I had it. I did a podcast with a guy a little while ago, huge podcast, and he went through eight questions. Where is it? You know, who's going to be there? Can I take photographs? Can I bring a friend? You know, what time's it finish? You know, what food's going to be there? All of these questions. And then he went, oh, what can I bring? You see, the bottom line of it is he asked eight questions that helped him. The eighth question was one that helped me. You see, when you turn up at a relationship, the first thing before opening your mouth is, what can I bring to this party? How can I benefit you? Now, you've got a podcast. We know you're on investment. Someone wants to get into Matt's world. How about turning up to Matt and going, hey, Matt, you've got a fantastic podcast. I've got a great network. I'd love to expose my network to your podcast. Would that be of interest? Now, what are you going to say? No, go away. You know, you're bringing value. You know, hey, hey, Matt, I know you in Dubai. I know some really good families. They always look for good opportunities. I'd love to make an introduction. Are you going to say no? These are things that benefit you. But then what are you instinctively going to want to do to that person that's just helped you? You're going to want to reciprocate. 
Now, I was actually stood next to Elton John. I was at a party of his in Hollywood. We stood there, and this guy walks up. One of the top donators to the Elton John AIDS Foundation walks up to him, and he said, hey, Elton, I'm going to throw a party in summer. Uh, How much is it going to cost me to get you to come over and perform? And Elton turned around and said, I can't. I'm busy then, and walked off. He didn't give him the date. Didn't even give him the location, but he was not going to be bought. See, that's the key. When you get to a point, anyone that can be purchased today doesn't have any money. But the second you've got money and you don't need money, you are not going to become a prostitute. You are not going to be purchased. You're not something that can be purchased off the shelf for X, Y, Z. So you need value. Hey, I'd like to do this, but how about me looking after your charity? How about me making a donation to your course? How about me actually providing computers to that school that you're building? How about me distributing that that new album? How about me telling people about that new book you've got coming out? These are all things that we've done. We've never turned around to anyone that we've worked with and gone, hey, how much? We've always turned around and gone, hey, we would like to do something with you But I noticed you have this going on, and I've got something that could benefit that. Would that be of interest to you? Oh, hell yeah, great. Then let me let you know what I'm looking to do in order for me to be able to help you. And that's what it was every single time. We had had an event with Oprah Winfrey, and we wanted to, my client wanted to meet Oprah Winfrey. And she wasn't doing anything in the U.S., doing nothing. In the year, wouldn't do any meet and greets in the US. There was some kind of contractual obligation. And then she went and did an event in Canada. And all of a sudden, we had the ability. So we turned around and said, Hey, these schools that you've just built, how would you like it to have a new Hewlett Packard computer in every single desk? And that was what we did. We actually looked after something she wanted, and my client went and had breakfast with her in Canada. I can't tell you how much I'm loving this conversation because, I mean, we communicate in slightly different ways, but literally everything you're saying is either, you know, the, you know, the, the complete same mindset I've got or the, or the same kind of strategies. I mean, I mean a, a, story, a story I often tell, you know, basically identical to what you're saying is, is there was a, there's a very famous uh, TV businessman over in the UK uh, that I'd been, I'd been trying to get on the podcast and I kind of wanted him on the podcast because I'd, I'd wanted to build a relationship with him. Could, I mean, could, could, could barely get his secretary's secretary to take a call. Um, and then heard that he was uh, he was a tennis fan, like ma- massive tennis fan, massive tennis player. Um, and I, I actually have a business. Well, it's not really a business, but I, I put a luxury event on uh, every summer in the UK, which is um, it's based around the legends of tennis. So you know, we, we get ex Wimbledon, ex US Open champions, uh, build a grass court in a, in a castle in the in the middle of the north of England. Uh, you know, not nice fancy lunch. Uh, champagne reception, big brands like Patek Philippe, Rolls Royce, etc. And they all invite their high net worth clients, and we we entertain them, you know, based around uh, the legends of tennis, playing exhibition type tennis. And I, uh, I mean, I, the reason I changed the word from saying it's a business is because it's not a business in the financial sense. It's it's a load of effort and a load of loss <laughs> loss loss to put on. But the reason I do the event. As I always say to everyone, is the the kudos value and the relationships that I get out of having that event are absolutely priceless. Yeah. You know, every day there's 300 high net worths. You know, there's the world's biggest brands, the celebrity players, and even if it costs me six figures to put the event on, believe me, it's worth more. It's worth much more than that in relationships and kudos because I am I am you know the king of the three days. Now, because of that, I've got the I've got the relationship with the players. You know, some who are good contacts, some who are very good friends. So all of a sudden, uh, my, my pitch changed to, uh, ch- changed to this, uh, this uh, TV businessman. And we contacted him and said, by the way, heard you're a tennis fan. Uh, how would you like a game of, a game of doubles with two, with two Wimbledon champions uh, on, on, on the grass court, private event, blah, blah, blah. You couldn't return the, you couldn't return the telephone call quick enough. Put, 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 put the game of tennis on. Yeah, you know, he got what he wanted. I've now, I've now got what I want, and um, and uh, yeah, everybody's happy. And I guess you know, it's 
I was starting to say in a different way at the beginning of this when we talk about networking that you know people don't appreciate how hard you need to work at networking, how much you need to invest, how much you need to give before you yep. receive, you know, deposit before you withdraw, and like, you know we, we've got so many, so many of the same stories and same philosophies here. Yeah, no, it's, and as we both laboured on it, you know, it is a skill set, it is a trial and error, and it is it is work. It's it's the same as going to the gym to build up your muscles. You've really got to use it. And that's also one of the problems with COVID. You know, COVID has created a lot of people to get lax, lazy, and shit at communication. It, you've got muscle memory, but you've got to get back into it. You've got to start communicating with people, and you've got to, you've got to start using that talent before you lose it. The one thing I would say, though, is you know, you talk about it as being network, sorry, being work, and you know, I've been hard work, which I guess ultimately it is. But uh, you know, like the old adage of, you know, if it's something you love, you, you'll never feel you've worked a day in your life. I always think that the reason people give networking a bad name is because they're doing it wrong. And I always say to people, well, you know, if you're walking into a, you know, a BNI breakfast or a, or, or, a, or a networking event room where everyone's going to dish out business cards, not knowing who they are, trying to sell their services as an accountant or a PR agent or what it is, well, that's networking in the way that uh, the old school understand it. And of course you don't like it because it's unproductive. It's shitty conversation. It's like the world's worst kind of speed dating. But if you go out there and specifically target the people that you want to build relationships with, put the effort into doing it, you know, whilst you may have to work at it to, to come up with the ideas of how are you going to give value, when you're actually carrying out that activity, yeah, how can it feel like work? You know, you know, when, when you're you know going around SpaceX with Elon, or or finding a way to deliver to Elton value to Elton John, or I'm playing tennis, you know, with with two two Wimbledon champions and a, and and a, and a famous TV businessman. You know, how could anyone think that that is horrible networking? It, it's like the funnest activity in the world. And if, if people were doing it right and understood what to do, all of a sudden networking would no longer be a dirty word. But how shit were you at it when you first started? Um, you know what? I gen I can't answer the question generally because because I kind of I don't remember you know that far back. Uh, and but, but, also, but it, and also, you don't recall the pain. You see, as human beings, you you know what it's like to to trap your thumb in a door or hit your thumb with a hammer. You know what the feeling's like, and it was painful. Correct. Yes, but the, but the thing is, can you actually recall the pain? You see, as human beings, we have a brilliant ability to actually not be able to. We know it hurts; that's a recognition, but we can't recall the actual pain. That's why you get people to get tattoo, and I got tattoos, and I get under the the, the needle, and I'm like, "Shit, this hurts." I'm never doing that again. And then six months later, I'll be like. Oh, let me get one done over here. We forget the pain. So when you're doing networking and you're nervous and you're awkward and you're asking the wrong questions and you're getting in a hot sweat and you go home, you go, never doing that again. And then you go back and you're a little bit better. And then you go back and you're a bit better, a bit better. Now, and this is the key, now you're starting to own your skill and be very selective in who you're networking with. Because we all know that we go to a networking event and there's a bunch of people in there that think it's a lottery option and they've just got to get as many business cards as possible. And we all know that the first time we ever go to a networking event, we get caught up with those people. And you go home and you think, well, that was a waste of time. You only learn if you go back again and again. And you see that person, you go, ah, I'm going to avoid that one. Because that one doesn't help me, but I'm going to go for these people because they're in the business I want. You learn how to select. Now, when you get better at it and when you've refined your talent, that's when it becomes easy. And that's when you forget all the shit conversations you had. And that's when you actually start looking forward to a networking event and you get to a networking event and all of a sudden you're walking through the door with such optimism and, and opportunity and such engagement, people start flocking to you. And you're like, networking's the easiest piece of shit in the world. It's great. It's wonderful because you went through all the gain at the beginning. And that's, it's like your podcast. How many podcasts have you been doing? You mentioned it earlier. 
Uh, I mean, I've been doing it for about four years in audio oh, yes. terms. I think this one's now probably 150, episode 155. In terms of YouTube videos, we're probably on over 600. And I, I probably know where you're going with this. You're going to say, what's that first video like? And I was fucking horrendous. Can't even watch it. Cannot even watch myself stop w- w- without cringing. And, and there you, you know, go. And by now, the time you get to video, it- video 100... Yeah, how hard is it now? How hard is it now for you to jump on a video with someone you don't know and start having a conversation? Oh, so easy, so easy. It's, o- it's only crap when you stop. Prior to that, it's education. You know, you were shit when you did your first podcast. Guarantee you, you probably look like a bumbling moron on your first networking event. Now you're good at both. It's a breeze, and people look at you and go, were you always this confident? Well, the truth of the fact is you learn that confidence. You learn that skill set. You learn how to show up by asking, what can I bring to your party? And that's what a lot of people need to realize. It is work until it becomes competence, and then it becomes think, fun. I think the big takeaway from you know this last two or three minutes as well is it, you know this isn't just applicable to networking or business. I mean, I mean this this is uh, applicable to everything in life. That you know until, until you start, you can't improve. You know, and 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 until you've improved, you're never going to enjoy it. And I, I'm over in, here in Dubai. I, I do a bit of boxing. Uh, it's my morning exercise. A bit of boxing, bit of, uh, and, a, and a bit of kicking. And the guy I train with, I only started training with him about a year ago. And uh, you know, I've done hand boxing with my as in just hands, not feet, for, for forever. And I last did any kickboxing at about 16 or 17 years old, and stopped doing it because I was crap at it, and you know, and I just never, never wanted to progress because I, I couldn't break that barrier of crapness. So when I started to train with this new guy, he said to me, "Right, we're going to do some kicking today." And I gave my usual line of, "No, nah, no, nah, mate, just, just, just ha- hands only, please. You know, I, I can't kick." And he was like, "I'm not having this. You know, you're kicking." I was like, we had a bit of arguing back and forth. He was like, you're training with me. You're doing what I tell you. You're kicking. And that first day of kicking, you know, I don't think I could get, I don't think I could get my kick above his ankle, <laughs> you know, but, but by, by a couple of weeks later, I'm halfway up his shin. And, you know, okay, now a year on and I'm still, I'm still crap by, let's say, global standards. I can just, just about get above his waist. But now I don't look at it and moan. I actually look at it and think, Matt, why the fuck did you not do this 25 years ago? And, uh, and, and, a, and a friend of mine has just moved to Dubai, so he's been coming training for the last two or three days. And again, he's, he's done a bit of boxing, and he's quite handy with his hands. Uh, and the guy said to him three days ago, right, we're doing some kicking. And he gives all the same excuses. Oh, no, no, I don't kick, mate. I've got a bad knee, got a bad this, that, and the other. And I was so excited to say to him, Darren, listen to me, mate. I said, I was saying exactly the same things as you a year ago. And my biggest regret now is somebody didn't push me harder 25 years ago. And... You know, there, there, there is no great secret here. There's no great magic trick, it's whether it's business, sport, whatever. You know, if, you don't, if you're not doing it, if you're not being shit, you're never going to be good. Yeah, there's a friend of mine that, uh, Ari Mizell, got a great statement. He always says, get going, then get good. And I've always told all of my coaching clients that the first time you do anything, it'll be shit. And when you acknowledge that, it takes the pressure off you because there's so many people going, oh, I want to do a podcast. It's got to be perfect. Well, it's going to be shit, you know, because you don't know what you're doing. The first time you write a business plan, it's going to be shit. First time you go networking, anything you do will be shit. And then there's a funny little thing that happens with entrepreneurs where we get comfortable by being shit. And that this is a weird thing. I often will look at people and I'll be like, oh, my God, that's so much better than me. They're so much more successful than me. And I race motorcycles and everyone's faster than me. Only because as soon as I get up to someone's standard, I can no longer see them. I'm now looking at the person above them. And I'm now, oh, my God, I'm shit compared to him. Catch up. Right, got him. Forget him. Ignore him. I'm shit compared to him. We raise our standards. And we're constantly achieving. That's what the aggravation in an entrepreneur is for. We constantly raise raise our standards to demand more of ourselves. And that's a good thing. A lot of people turn around and go, you're never satisfied. You never settle. Oh, poor you. Are you kidding? I'm having a great time seeing what I'm capable of. And when I look back and I go, well, hang on a minute. If I'd have settled, I'd still be a bricklayer in Leightonstone. 
Oh, by the way, I was just hanging out in the papal gardens with the Pope. You know, that that's kind of cool. You know, so I'm always, it's not a case of not being satisfied. It's a case of what can I do? Is that curious child? Another friend of mine once said that um, the definition of hell is to, to meet the man or woman you could have been. And I never want to be able to meet them other than that person that was because they tried. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't put it better myself. And yeah, I guess you know, you could say that re- re- regret is worse than embarrassment, or or, or 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 whatever expression, whatever expressions you want to use. But yeah, I mean, you know, so 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 true in every area of life. Now, I want to talk to you about branding because just before we started to record this, uh, we were talking about what you do, and you said, you know, I have a branding agency, but then you then you were clear to finish that off by saying, branding agency, not a marketing agency. What, what 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 do you actually mean by that by by that statement? And yeah, you know, I guess you know where where did the where does the branding and the marketing differ? So branding is what you stand for. Marketing is distribution of that brand and that message. And with a lot of companies and individuals growing personal brands and uh, definite uh, branding campaigns, me and my son Henry we launched Sims Media, and we focus on branding. Are you confusing to your client? If you met someone that didn't know you and they looked at your website, they met you in the street, they listened to you speaking on stage and they saw your Facebook adverts, would they know what you stand for? Would they understand you? Now, you, you saw me on someone else's podcast and you probably looked at my website and maybe some other media of me. Was there any disconnect between what you had heard on the podcast and what you saw online. Was there any? No. No, because you need to be impossible to misunderstand. Here's a weird thing. I'll give you a little test, and this is a freebie for your clients. Open up all of your social pages on your desktop. This is not something you can do on your phone. So on a laptop or a desktop, open up your uh, Twitter, your Facebook, your Instagram, your Pinterest, your TikTok, whatever. But open them all up. And then look at them. Are you the exact same person on every platform? Nine times out of 10, the answer becomes a big roaring no. Because you've got a picture on here from 10 years ago. You've got a picture of you with someone you're not even dating anymore. Your bio is different to the one over here. You don't put the company link on that one, but it's on that one over there. But when you look up Apple, they are Apple every single place. Like I'm Steve D. Sims. Everywhere, stevedsims.com, Steve D. Sims on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. I'm the same person everywhere. I don't want you confused. So we focus when we're working with people to make sure that there's no confusion. Your brand message is the same, what you stand for, and understand a brand is what people say about you when you're not in the conversation. So everything you do has got to make sure that they have the narrative do you want them to have? Now, once you're crystal clear with that, the next step, well, that's marketing. How do I take what I stand for and distribute it across mediums, platforms, stages, blogs, posts, articles, TV, radio, whatever, all of those are media distributions. That's marketing. But so many people go, yeah, I got a new company, got a website. I'm going to shove 10 grand into Facebook ads. If you don't have a crystal clear call to action on what it is the solution you are to and what that problem is, then all you're doing is distributing confusion. So we are a branding agency first and a marketing company second. So let, let me ask you a specific question on that from a from a very very selfish perspective. Then this is this is me 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 picking your brains and getting free advice at the same time. So I. Uh, Probably 12 months ago, nine or 10 months ago, I uh, went to a guy to uh, get him to do some uh, Facebook ads, uh, you know, YouTube ads, etc., for me. And this guy has a bit of a branding agency as, as well as marketing. He's involved in, in personal branding. And he said to me, right, before we do your ads, we need, you know, we need to clean up some inconsistency with your brand. I said, well, what, what's that? He said, well, I'm looking at you and I don't know who you are. 
I said, why? In what way? He said, well, some of your pictures, you know, you're giving business advice or some of your posts, you know, you're doing videos, giving business advice or, or talking about your expertise in funding, et cetera. Some of your other pictures, you know, you're, 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 you're in a restaurant with, you know, with celebrities and some of your other pictures, you know, you, you, st you stood at the top of a mountain getting your ass out. And, you know, that's, it's, it's a very inconsistent message. And, and I said, well, I actually don't, to me, it's not an inconsistent message. It says, because I am a funding expert who eats dinner with celebrities and likes to get his ass out a lot. And, you know, and, and that's, the, that's the same guy on Instagram that it is on Facebook. It's the same guy that you, you would meet in, in real life. You would never, if you know me, I don't think you would ever find inconsistency. And my personal view is, if you don't like me on Insta, then you won't like me in real life. And if you don't like me in real life, we're not going to do any business anyway, so what the fuck do I care? And me and him, me, me and him had a big diff you know, difference of opinion over this point. And in the end, I just had to say, well, listen, mate, I take on, on board your, your comments. However, I'm going to overrule you because I don't fancy cha cha changing what I consider to be my personal brand. Crack on with the Facebook ads, please. Um, I mean, do, who, who do you agree with, him or me? Um, him and then you. You see, you don't have to change the pictures, but you need to make them current and consistent. You see, the little picture that you have up there can be different visuals. It can be the celebrity meal. It can be you playing off with your ass out. It can be you doing a business. But are they current pictures or is like a 20-year gap between each picture? Okay, no, no, so as, um, Right. So as long as they're current pictures, that satisfies consistency. They are you today. If I bumped in the street, I would recognize you. I'll give you one of the worst offenders of this real estate agents, especially women. Now, I've spoken at probably the biggest real estate conventions in the planet, and they all seem to make the same mistake. The ladies will have a picture that they took in 1983 that made them look thinner and slimmer, and are still using that picture today, so that when you meet them, there's a disconnect. You feel as though you've been lied to. Now, if I'm looking at your social, and then I meet you in the street, I want to meet the person that I've made the opinion on from your social. If you're trying to sound more articulate, if you're trying to look suave, if you're using statements that a copywriter wrote that you couldn't even say, let alone spell, then there's a disconnect. And when there is a disconnect, you become confused, concerned, and think as though you've been lied to, and now you have that mentality. No one can jump in a business with someone who's been lied to. So the pictures, he's right. But then so are you on the consistency. What I want to draw down to is the next thing. Um, are you are, are you a speaker by any chance? Uh, I mean, I, I do the odd bit. I mean, I, I, I okay. So it's not your main thing, it, but not my main thing, no. All right, but you've got a regular podcast. We know that. Yep. Is the word podcast host in every single one of your social bios across every platform? Yes. Is what you do for a living the exact same? Now, this is what's different. Some people will write the one on Twitter, write the one on Facebook. You don't need to do that. Whatever you have on Twitter, copy, paste, yeah. paste, paste. So it's the exact same statement. The picture has to be current and the bio has to be exactly. Let me give you an argument's sake. Let's say you got a team in England, okay? If you phoned up your team, and you said to your team, wherever they are in the world, at nine o'clock tomorrow morning, let's jump on a Zoom and we're going to talk about the headlines of the world that happened yesterday. We're going to talk about them tomorrow at nine o'clock. And nine o'clock comes along. You've got your team on there and you go, what's going on? Well, this is happening in Ukraine. This is happening in England. This is happening in America. This is happening with politics. This is You'd all have the same headlines, wouldn't you? Yep. But if you turned around to people and said, right, where did you get your information? Oh, I got them from Dubai Morning News. I got them from CNN. Oh, I got it from BBC. Those are platforms of consumption. They're all giving you the exact same news. Maybe there's a little bit of a spin on it, but the headlines are still the same. But you're getting it from a different level. What we need to make sure of is when they're looking for Matt, they consume the media where they consume. You're not saying, hey, don't look at me on Twitter. Only look at me on Instagram. We need to make sure that the feeling, vibe, 
and traction that you've created on Instagram is identical to what you post on Twitter. You see, you'll get a lot of people that will turn around and go, well, I could do that on Facebook, but I can't put it on LinkedIn because LinkedIn's a business network. Oh, you- I, always, I always have that argument with people, you know, because I, I, I tend to take my same content. I may do a little bit of repurposing for, for, for uh, you know, shape and size, et cetera, but I always, I yeah. always put it on, on the same stuff. And I'll always get comments from people saying, oh, no, no, that's a Facebook post because that's, that's fun or that's cheeky. You know, you can't put that on LinkedIn because that's business and corporate. I thought, that's bollocks. I think you, 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 you brand your brand. You are accurate. You see, here's the thing. You said in your conversation that if they don't like who you are, they're not going to do business with you in any case. The only point of a social platform is to allow people to make that judgment before they've had that conversation. So what you post on Instagram, what you post on Facebook should be the exact same as what you post on Pinterest and LinkedIn so that you are giving people an insight into who you are, what you stand for, what you like, what you don't like, and allowing them to be unconfused. There is a uh, a group of people in the planet, which nine times out of 10, we create that are the worst environment in the world. There are people in the planet that love you, Matt. You know that. There are people that just, they don't even have to know you. And they see you in a pub and they just freaking love you. They see you in business. They see you in an event. They listen to you on a pub. That Matt, I just fucking love that guy. And then there's also a bunch of people in the planet that want nothing to do with you. They don't like you because of your haircut, because of your height, because of your accent, because of the wrong color T-shirt. They just fucking hate you, mate. You know? It's just going to happen. And then there's those people in the middle. Those are the only ones you've got to have a conversation with. But you don't want to confuse them because if you confuse them, they now become fences. And they're sitting there going, this Matt, I'm not sure about him. I, You know, is he a businessman? Is he a guy that gets his pants down? I'm not. I, I, I'm a bit confused. But by you being you, and the brand of you being clearly recognizable, it allows them to go, shit, I hate this guy, and falling off of the fence onto the hater side, or, my God, I love that guy, he stands for what he does, I'm in the love camp. But you've got to get rid of those people in the middle, and you get rid of it by being crystal clear on who you are. So your statements, the branding guy is correct. Continuity across all platforms. But that's continuity is not necessarily the picture. It's the terminology, the tonality. And that's a key thing that people miss out on, the tonality. When you're trying to build up your Instagram page by posting other people's quotes and pictures, that's not your tone. You know, you've got to have your tonality. Express that, that's champion. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, one of the things I always talk to people about, and again, you know, love, love to get your input on this uh, with personal branding. You know, a, a lot of people will ask, will ask me, you know, who can I go to to do this? Or who can I do, go to to do the other? And I, my view always is, whilst you may take a bit of input from people, for me, you know, the clue with personal branding is in the title, i.e. it's personal branding. And I, and I, I think, you know, the more you give away, the more diluted it will be or the more off-brand off brand it will actually be. And I can always say that, I say this from personal experience, when in my early days, you know, PR guys would ha- handle my Insta or handle my, you know, ghost-written type content. And I'd read this stuff back and I'd cringe and I'd think, fucking hell, you know, I would, I would never speak like that. Or, you know, these, these cheesy quotes that have been, you know, ripped off someone else and I'm, 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 I'm posting on it. And for me, you know, and I, I'm, until you take charge of it yourself and put, you know, put your image in, put your brand in. Okay, I mean, maybe if you can, uh, if you can articulate that brand vision, uh, you know, like perfectly, so that other people can then take it on and and do it. They may do it to a degree, but I don't think anyone can ever do it like you. I really don't think you can build a personal brand unless you are prepared to devote at least a reasonable amount of time and effort into it. I've got a story for you. So I used to send out these emails when I had the concierge firm. And the con- they would be things like, you know, we've got access to this. We've we just designed this. You know, would you like to do that? It was all these different kind of things. I can't spell for shit, okay? It's amazing that I've written 
an email, let alone two books. But I just, I just can't. But you can get other people to go through the grammar. And at one stage, I thought to myself, hang on a minute, I'm charging hundreds to millions for my experiences. I better, I better step up my game. So I got hold of a company. And I said, look, I want you to do my newsletters. I'll tell you what I've got. You do my newsletters. So they used to get these amazing pictures. They did a template for my email. And every time I tell them what I'd have, they did this amazing copy that was so vivid and colorful of what could be done. And we would send it out. And we did it for a while and I got unsubscribed and nothing really changed on the business except for maybe less conversations. And I'm like, guys, you do beautiful emails. You do beautiful copy. It really is exciting. I loved it. I thought it looked amazing. But I went, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening to the bottom line. We did this for like two or three months. So we gave it time. And we're like, I, I've got to let this go. You know, I'm just wasting my time here. We're seeing no gain. And then something came up and I I did the newsletter. I put the newsletter together. I threw a picture up there. I wrote me a little bit of thing, push send. And someone came back to me that was a client. And all he said on the email was, glad to see you back. He recognized that the other stuff hadn't come from me. And that's all he wrote. And I realized that it's not the misspelling. That's just you. We're all imperfect, but people want to be able to relate and recognize. The second I brought someone in coming up with terminology that I couldn't even say or spell, they were like, whoa, that's not Steve. Who's this? What's going on? And they, were, they weren't looking at what was available. They were now conflicted with someone that they had fallen in love with. And that's what I had to get rid of. I'll send out an email now. It'll have no grammar in there. There'll be no full stops. And I'm doing absolutely fine with it. Listen, Steve, I mean, I could go on and on all night uh, or all day for you, uh, picking your brains and talking about these things. And I mean, look, this podcast really is absolutely every hour. I hoped it would be a more. And I, I, I always I always say to my, you know, my audience or, or, or my friends when I talk about the podcast, that in a way, it's a, a completely selfish activity that, uh, you know, if no one ever watches it, I kind of yeah. don't care because I get yeah. to I get to talk to amazing people uh, and, and ask them the questions I, I want to ask. And that, you know, ultimately, if anyone does listen, then they get the, the they get the extra benefit of being able to hear the great advice that I get to hear. And I think, you know, really this, you know, for me, the last hour has, has, has summed up uh, all of that and more. So thank you so much for being here, mate. Um, I guess you know, before you go, for anyone who wants to hear more of you, see, see more of you, uh, and I will be going to download a copy of your book after this, but uh, yeah, to t tell the guys at home where to find you. I'm very easy. I'm Steve D. Sims everywhere. D for dashing. There's only one M in Sims. I'm at stevedsims.com. Go for Stupid is the book, or you can find me anywhere that you consume your media under Steve D. Sims. Perfect. And guys, uh, I actually am as consistent as I uh, as I told Steve, Steve I am. And as always, you can find me at the Matt Haycox. That's T-H-E-M-A-T-T-H-A-Y-C-O-X. The Matt Haycox on all things social. Uh, if you've been watching this on YouTube, you can consume it in your audio formats and all the places you would normally listen to, Spotify, podcast, uh, et cetera. Uh, sorry, Spotify uh, and iTunes, et cetera. And if you've been listening to the audio version, then there is a video version on YouTube where you get to see my pretty face as well as hearing my voice. So check me out on one if you haven't on the other. And until next time, thank you very much.